What's up, everyone? Welcome. We are live right now on Cannabis. And if you're joining us on YouTube or on Spotify, thank you so much for joining us. We are super stoked to have you. We have some great guests on the show today. We have AJ from The Plant Stable. We've also got Neptune from Neptune Seed Bank. We're going to be talking all about what AJ has been up to in Oregon. He's been in the dispensary growing, like legal growing scene and then doing other things. And he's also growing and making some really awesome strains. So we're going to be talking about those. I've been growing them one of, uh, one of those myself for like the last 15 months or so. It's one of my favorites. Um, so we're going to be talking about that in just a second. But before we do, I need to give a couple shout outs to our friends and supporters. First off, shout out to everyone in the Cannabuzz community. If you enjoy these episodes, join our community. Search Cannabuzz in the App Store. Use the code GROWERSLOVE for 50% off. You can join for as little as four dollars and 20 cents a month and what that does is it gives you access to our live streams when we do these interviews you can ask questions in there and then we also do giveaways every month and at the end of every interview so uh, we'd love to see you over there also shout outs to our friend uh, friends at lost coast plant therapy check out lost coast plant therapy.com if you need some um, things to fight bugs botrytis things like that um, pm check out lost coast plant therapy.com and then also check out our friends over at sacred three mushrooms.com if you are looking for some fungi grow kits. So those are our first couple shout outs. And then I'm going to throw it over to JR for the remainder uh, of the shout outs. Well, uh, the rest we're going to talk about what Tiki has to offer. Um, our last episode with Tiki was really great. Um, we got to talk about the process for TikiCuts.com. Uh, he has some great offerings there. And uh, all, all March, uh, he's doing 50% off and free shipping. Uh, so hit up tkicuts.com. And then today, our Nugs Deep uh, with Neptune Seed Bank, uh, we're featuring one of AJ's selections here. And we have the Plant Stables Voodoo Fruit. And so I thought while we have uh, the breeder here, we might as well ask him, uh, AJ, tell us about the uh, Voodoo Fruit. Yeah, so the Voodoo Fruit is Forbidden Fruit and Caribbean Vampire. Uh, uh, I was going to say Voodoo Fruit. Uh, forbidden Fruit is one of my just all-time favorite mothers that I've had for quite some time. Um, got it here in Oregon. Just always delivers that really terpy, um, tangy, fruit punchy, full mixture, you know, of fruit like terpene profile. Um, always really deep, dense purple nugs. Uh, I've just always really enjoyed and loved that plant. So it is pretty much always going to be a mom that I put into all of my stud project. Really any project I do for Bitten Fruit is going to probably be a part of it. Nice. I, yeah. I've been growing this particular strain because you sent me some of these seeds like, I don't know, yeah. like a year and a half ago now or something like that. And I've been growing it now and I found a particular pheno uh, that I like and it gets purple very early on in flower. Yeah. And it just had super purple flowers, like spears of purple flowers, and it smelled really good. And so I'm super excited to grow it again um, this summer. Um, but yeah, any Next. other notes about the plant, like the, about voodoo fruit in particular, since we're calling it out? Yeah, sure. So it does really well outdoors. Like you said, it's normally pretty minimal on the botrytis side and late. Like I've been growing it out in the Pacific Northwest and grown it everywhere from like the coast uh, to more of like inland. So it, I would say on the coast, it definitely does have more like it will get PM or botrytis easier than it will in a drier area. Just because it's like, you know, duh, but it seems to be more resilient than most, um, which is kind of cool for like those deeper, darker purple strains that you really want to take deeper into the season because you want to pull out all those full colors. Um, indoors, though, I've always experienced it being like a really easy plant to grow, always delivers like on the forbidden fruit dominant side of things, you're always going to get those really deep, dense purple buds, always going to get that flavor. But then on the Caribbean vampire side of things, um, which I really like is it, it's more, well, Forbidden Fruit already has tight internodal spacing. Caribbean Vampire does as well, so you kind of get that. But then you get a little bit of the tighter nug structure on the Caribbean Vampire with that more of gas and then the added trichomes. So with the combination, I think that there's a possibility to find, you know, one of those really, really epic purple frost monsters that all, also has like the higher THC, which is going to be rare on, you know, the deep dominant purple type stuff. 
Awesome. Not that THC like matters, but you know what I'm saying. More psychoactive yeah. like, effect is, I guess, what I'm saying. Definitely, it matters in the stores. Would you? Yeah, yeah right. That's, that's for sure. So, yeah. I don't care about the turbs. I just want some crap. Yeah. Yeah. Know. Yo, that yeah, Caribbean so, fire is fucking bomb, dude. That thank you, man. Bomb, like. You're right too. I always tell people they're like, "Oh, I need something that crushes outside." I'm always like, "Oh, I got something for you." Like sure. I always recommend a lot of your gear and a lot of uh, massive seeds gear as well because outside those things just fucking slap. And like you're saying, it goes really good late season, really good late season. Yeah, that's why I like anything forbidden fruit, dude. Bomb, so good. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know you still. Do you still have that cut of the forbidden fruit? Yeah, yeah, I still have. Well, I mean, I don't have it personally with me, but yeah, we still got it around. Damn, bro, save that. That's like one of those ones that like was super popular and everybody dumped because everybody thought somebody else was going to save it and yeah. nobody saved it. So like nobody has it. So you have some fucking gold right there. Yeah, yeah. no, there's a couple of things I've been hanging on to, like the Shoreline clone. Uh, I've been doing a lot of projects with that because that's like super yeah. special to me. But just stuff like that, that is now making a resurgency somewhat. But like mm-hmm. a lot of people got rid of it just because of like yeah. what you just said, someone else has got it kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, people are so funny. They're like, oh, I don't I don't like that particular like turp profile anymore. This is like the problem with like I think the whole breeding side right now is like if someone says something that i don't like the turf profile people throw all like this specific turf profile away like oh then Mm -hmm. that's what the market doesn't want and but like you see like the guys that just stick to their guns and like well i don't give a fuck i'm going to continue to breed with this i'm going to continue to to run with this they seem to be the ones that are doing good right now because all the breeders are just running from one to the other to the other it's all the same shit you know what i'm saying so if like a a sales point of view it's like dog how many times can i sell the same same cut how many times can i sell the same thing so mm-hmm. good for you and man. I, think, that. I think to add to that people's palettes are becoming more diversified yeah absolutely yeah 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 and the uh i mean yeah those old school ones will you know they'll the the new school of course like has better aspects in some ways but i think the old school will never in terms of some of those older strains if people just keep them they'll never go out of style they might go you know, in and out of trend, but they're never going to be like not relevant in my personal opinion. So and especially from a breeding perspective. And now that we have services like uh, conception nurseries where you can give them your cut and they'll take yep. it back to gen zero. I mean, to be able to, like Mark says, just archive and hold on to these. I mean, because yeah. I can remember before OG Kush, we had all these great fucking strains that were I was just going to say that. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Just gonna say that you lost everything because OG yeah. was reign supreme. So, like the original Roadkill Skunk, like where is that? No one's got it. No one's got it. Mm-hmm. You, you get it, I'll make you rich. You know what I'm saying? You got right. it. Yeah, sure. Anybody in the cannabis community, you got it. Hit me up. I'll make you fucking rich. You know what I'm saying? Because we can move a, a ten thousand pounds of that tomorrow if we have yeah. a real one. Nope, nobody. But it's nobody has it. Nobody finds it. You know what I'm saying? Just all yeah, it's funny you say that, Mark, because I smelt it on a chick at a fucking punk rock show in like 2007, and I know that fucking smell from anywhere. You know that smell. So you know that smell. Yeah, it's, it, 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 I'm like, I, I was, you know, I'm. It was an all age show, and she's probably 14, so I felt weird like creeping <laughs> on her. But I was like, I, I wanted to know where'd you get that fucking weed, you know? <laughs> you get that weed, girl. I need that. Yeah, dude. I got some I got some stuff I want to show y'all that I could show you guys in flower, but I'm trying to work. I'm not I'm not going to get in the controversy of saying I'm working on like an RKS, but I'm trying to work on that like nasty, skunky trash, um, like hot garbage piss type terps. Um, and yeah. I got the shoreline really has that like hot garbage nastiness to it. And then when it's grown, in my opinion, properly in or in a, in a, in a more organic type of way, you get that like deep, like piss to it. So it's almost like hot garbage and piss, which just when you smell it, you're like, Ugh, what the hell's going on in this thing? Right. Um, and so I'm making back crosses now and a lot of them are coming out like really funky. So I'm, I'm excited that I'm going to try or I'm trying to do something with that. And then introducing like OG and UK cheese um, to it to maybe try to pull out that, I don't know, because no one's found, like you guys are saying, no one's found that secret sauce of like, let's slam these together again and create that like reminiscent skunk. But I mean, there's a lot of like foul shit out there because a lot of the GMO shit, in my opinion, 
depending on how it's grown, you can get that, like, what is this, like, kind of foulness to it where it doesn't smell like all the other GMOs, but there's just something about it where you're like, you know, it really, like, just gets up in there. I felt that way about the garlic breath. I thought that garlic breath was particularly rancid. I mean, Mm -hmm. intensely rancid. So let's kind of move forward a little bit, AJ. Um, The last time we talked to you was on a breeder panel, and we had some audio problems that in technical issues that did the yeah. episode didn't last very long, but so kind of catch us up. You were uh, kind of moving into a wreck situation at that time. Kind of talk about that a little bit, if you could. Yeah. So I took over as a director of operations for a farm um, in Northern Oregon and pretty much uh, went on to the job thinking that I was just going to kind of be, helping a little bit with the cultivation and then helping out majorly with their uh, sales and kind of the back end sort of stuff, uh, getting a proper uh, dry trim cure, um, I guess, crew and SOPs set in place for them and then handle on the back end more of the the sales and all of that good stuff. And it turned into pretty quickly me running the cultivation. Um, The cultivation team there was uh, a younger crew of guys. A um, couple of them were super fucking strong. One of my dudes, Wyatt Frank, you're fucking amazing, my guy. Um, huge shout out to Wyatt. He pretty much ran that um, grow when his the the last guy left, and then I was managing them all because it was very new to them being thrown into a position where they were the managers and they were in control. So I was pretty much running the grow at that point, but then also. There were problems with uh, the post-production, so I ended up having to run that, having to build a trim crew. Um, I wasn't given any leads on any sales, so I built that whole, tried to build a, a sales, um, I guess, route and you know, customer base, wholesale base. All I was pretty much running the whole thing, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of work. I'll say that yeah. a lot of a lot of 60, 80 hour weeks, 62, 80 hour weeks, I should say. <laughs> Yeah, actually, our next question was going to be essentially like what kind of um, work were you doing there? What kind of job it was? And I was kind of thinking about this question in the context of I think a lot of us that are um, home growers or, you know, like marijuana enthusiasts or whatever you want to call us, we think about the legal uh, market and kind of growing at the scale that you were just talking about. And it's exciting. It sounds interesting. And it's also not exactly clear, like how it works. So I'm excited to talk to you guys both today about all this kind of stuff to just help people understand. uh, And then also learn some of the lessons that you've learned as well. Um, So yeah, could you explain, I guess, like, what was your job title or whatever that they brought you in as and then what were you effectively doing i guess so i technically i guess was brought as um i think it was like farm manager was a generic title and that was like more of managing just the people helping out with procurement of like supply like a lot more of behind the scenes kind of stuff but what ended up happening after basically a month of working there was full director of operations full hands-on every department um, rebuilding every SOP they had or trying to putting in, um, you know, just everything I could to make sure that the guys that we had, um, guys and gals that we had could perform at their best level without me being able to be everywhere to help with everything and all the time. And a lot of them just didn't have the experience. They were great to work with and they were, they did their best, but they just, um, it was a very small town where the farm was. And a lot of them, this, that had been their only cannabis experience with that farm. And um, a lot of the things that they were taught before I had arrived, not necessarily were wrong, but they didn't apply to the new way we needed to do things in order to like maximize efficiencies and to really um, make the grow profitable and to try to get it back on, you know, a, a better track kind of thing. Well, I think one of the things, one of the uh, kind of topics that Mark has brought up in the past is that idea of these people draw you in and then they suck you for all your talent, all your SOPs. You basically set up all of their business for them. And then at the end of the day, they don't deliver. And so it seems like that's a real repeatable pattern. And so... I think, Mark, you can speak to this. There's a lot of guys out there who have learned this lesson and they're just waiting in the wings. 
Well, I, I mean, unfortunately, yeah, it's, it's, it's how it goes, dude. So it's like, there's, it's almost better at this point, to be honest, as if like a coalition of actual cannabis people got together and opened, funneled their money together and opened an actual cannabis business. Because what happens is these big money guys, they come in and they just realize like, it's just cheaper to let somebody sue them, you know, because it's like, yeah. Whoever has the most money, because I don't know if anybody's been to court, but I've been to court a few times, you know, unfortunately. But it turns out this way. Freedom ain't free. The guy who has the most money is the one who's going to win. So corporations got big money, so they can just say, fuck you. I'll see you in court. I'll tie it up. You got to pay $400 an hour to your attorney. How long can you do that? You know, and so you end up settling for pittance. And this is why. I mean, but this is why, if, again, if you ask me, and this is just because of my own personal feelings, so I hope nobody takes this to heart. I think corporate cannabis or any kind of cannabis that's not run by actual cannabis people is is silly, you know, because first of all, they're growing strains that are two, three years old that nobody wants anymore. Second of all, they're just running through people, you know, and they're taking what they want. They're taking this they're and they're teaching they're teaching people who are enthusiasts like the like the low end workers, the water boys, the you know what I'm saying? Shit like that. Teaching them bad habits. And, you know, it, it's not a real, it's, it's just not really good anymore. And that's why you're seeing the black market just reign supreme. Guys who grow good weed are not going to stop growing good weed. Oh, you fired me from this corporate job. Oh, ho-hum, I'm just going to go get a job doing something else. Nah, bitch, I'm going to throw my 10 lights up in my fucking garage, and I'm going to get back to work doing what I know how to do. So, I don't know, man. It's just, it's just absolutely silly to me. Like, I was just in Florida you know, on a, on a consult, really good things, but it was just like a massive, massive facility, a massive facility. Like one of the things I've seen the best in the plants just looked like trash. Cause like you guys spent fucking $150 million on this facility and the license and not a single grower knows what the fuck they're doing. You know what I mean? And it's just like, and what do you got? You're growing blue dream, you're growing blue dream dog. And they're a foot tall in flower the fuck are you doing you know what i'm saying but like i'm like all right well you hired me for tc work you didn't hire me for anything else so I, i'm here to do tc work you know so i don't know it's just crazy bro just but i don't know whatever and so what what aj what were kind of the you know the dangling of the carrot was was it that really made you want to jump in on that opportunity well, I mean, one thing that I was told from the beginning, and so I, anyways, we can get down to it, but, uh, you know, I got to grow basically the, the cultivation area in terms of what was picked to grow. I had full carte blanche, so I could do pretty much, I mean, I could grow fucking 50 lighter tomatoes if I wanted to. And which is funny enough is they would have probably came in and gone, Oh, I haven't seen red circle weed before. And I would have been like, yeah, yeah, yeah it's a new. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Real juicy. That fruit's real yeah. juicy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so um, that was fun in terms of like, I, uh, my, my time there while it lasted, I had, um, I feel very accomplished in what I was able to do. And my guys and gals that worked for me, I like to believe that we all, um, you know, had a great run together and we all enjoyed each other's time and we respected one another and we worked hard for one another because we knew we had to work hard for one another uh, without saying too much else. That was the only reason we we really every day did the bullshit we did and put up with what we put up with was because we could we yeah. could see it in front of our eyes. Yeah. We could see like this shit is great. We could see the the healthy plants. We could see new strains like a bunch of stuff, um, not to like toot my own horn, but you know, like brand new shit that no one else has. That's like, we're the only people in the world with it just because it's like, you know, stuff I bred and it's right here. And it was pheno hunted at the facility. And like, that was really rewarding for a lot of people who, um, like didn't really get to experience that ever with cannabis before, but then, you know, then they could see on the back end when they looked into, cause initially when I got there, everyone thought I was full of shit. But then when they looked into my background and the website and everything, and saw like, okay, he's, you know, he's actually doing the work. This isn't just some guy saying, we're going to grow all this unique shit and then brings in a bunch of bullshit, you know, clones from wherever. Cause like, that's one thing I can say too. consulting at a bunch of places. It's amazing how many people just get either tricked or just don't have the knowledge or whatever with certain like clone companies, because they'll be like, oh yeah, we got all this shit here. Check out this 
what whatever um obama runs or whatever you know hype thing it is and you're like well i've never seen obama runs but i can tell you that ain't it because that looks like garbage <laughs> and everyone growing it says it looks fucking awesome so like something's happening here um, right yeah and so now with the breeding opportunity you were what kind of pheno hunts were you able to do on some of your selections Oh, I was able to to run a lot. So like on the Bahama butter, for instance, we did like 150, um, but that turned into like 200 and something because we ran over 100 females. Um, and then we threw like a lot of what I did there too is because I personally have so much seed stock of my stuff. Like I grew pretty big plants when I was doing my projects because I always kind of thought like I always want to have a reserve, a big reserve for myself just for whatever reason. Um, and I had the space. So it was kind of like, why not fucking grow big plants, get a bunch of seeds? Um, I'm already doing the project. So because of that, I kind of could just germinate. Like I could just do one of those things where I grabbed a whole fucking handful and I didn't even count and just fucking threw them in the towel and let them go. And then just cold for any which reason that I saw fit during the whole growing phase. So if anything was weird, like in the seedling form, toss it. Like I just, I really, at when you're, in my opinion, when you're doing bigger hunts than like a hundred or more, you you do have that opportunity to really get rid of shit quick, quicker in my opinion, because you have so much more view of the phenodiversity and you can really just see like the golden ones quicker in my opinion. I mean, you do want to run a rerun stuff, of course, but like on just first glances, I feel like if you run a hundred, you know, you pick your top, ones pretty quickly because they're like so much more special than the rest of the litter if that makes sense i guess yeah but then you know you always have that handful of 20 or 30 that you got to start narrowing down and then oh, it, yeah. as you, and it starts getting harder and harder so now were you <laughs> able to walk away with all your intellectual property in this nope. situation no, and I uh, no, and I didn't want to even argue about a lot of it. Um, I'm kind of of the mindset of I'm never going to stop popping seeds, and I'm never going to stop. I'll have avenues and farms all over the country for the foreseeable future. So I have, it, okay, the best way to put this, at that last job, they can keep whatever because I know you're going to rename it all. I know you're going to fucking rename it, and that's fine. <laughs> but, but, I'm sorry to laugh, but that's Yeah, funny. no, I know. I know they will. It's fine. But. I, I mean, like, I can feel fine and, like, I know what I did there and um, those, like, people can speak to what I did there that worked there and if they want to take, like, you know, they paid me for my time and they allowed me to do that and I did not want to have any type of, oh, he stole from us, oh, he did X, Y, and Z. So I just left right, everything right. there with yeah. zero qualms. Um, but I have plenty of stuff, you know, that was a mutual um thing that was done like in my time there that i still obtain um but yeah. i guess the better way to put it is there's plenty of stuff i left with um zero qualms to myself because i'm not trying to get mixed up in some bullshit thing with them when i will literally pheno hunt something in the next couple weeks that i'm sure i'll dig and not to say that one's better than the other but like there's so much shit now like yeah. out there and there's so much to do and i'm never gonna stop popping so like it's almost like on to the next one kind of thing. Um, but, but I just yeah, wanted to I just wanted to kind of highlight that because I think that's also one of the traps that you know cultivators get into oh, yeah. when they come into these situations is you know they have a name, they have a brand, and then they next thing you know they have no intellectual property and you know they're sleeping on some guy's couch. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, the one good thing though is I did get them to sign. The thing I immediately when I got got on was, and basically just the recognition of I am the plant stable. Everything from me is my intellectual property. If I bring something in, you get to have the the clone or the plant, but that never, never turns into your IP. It's always my IP. You just get to grow the cut. And since I'm gone now, I'm sure, like I said, they'll probably be whatever they do is whatever they want to do. It's not my business. But at the end of the day, they can't do anything about me selling my seeds or selling clones of what I got because it's mine at the end of the day. Man, that's really a mature way to go about it. You know, honestly, that's that's really cool of you. Because, you know, those oh. Chris will probably try to sue you if they could. You know what I mean? Or I'm oh, sure, yeah. I'm, maybe not. I'm sure they're great guys, but, or maybe they're, I don't know. But I just, well, any corporate guy, I'm just like, I hate you. <laughs> I mean, oh, I yeah. I mean, it's, it's happened before, too. So, like, I think maybe that's, it's happened two times before. So, I, like, at this time, at this point, I feel like I've just, uh, 
had to, I guess, let a lot go in terms of like my plants. And um, just, I guess my whole thing is that's why I love pheno hunting is I can just yeah. keep finding cool shit and I can keep, yeah. keep relighting my own passion kind of thing. Yeah. Well, see, that's the thing, right? That's, that's the thing is because you're, you're, you're a breeder and you can pheno hunt. And that's, and that's why I think always like, in, in the end, the little guys, you know, not to say you're a little guy or whatever, but like the smaller, like smaller hogs in the wheel will always win because these big MSOs and all these things, they have to be mind readers. They have to think, they have to know what's going to be popular a year from now, two years from now and set it mm-hmm. up because they're these, they're these giant lumbering boats that have to like turn very slowly where like smaller dudes are like speedboats. Like, oh, I could turn on a dime. I could, I could pop 2000 seeds tomorrow and have something completely unique and and it'll catch fire and then i you know like it's almost better to just like pheno hunt make a better living like pheno hunting finding something bomb selling the seeds selling the clones like that's mm-hmm. what i'm finding a lot of a, a lot like i think like for my you know my humble opinion i'm seeing a lot of the um the the the, the romanticism of like going to these big dispensaries and all this in these states is kind of waning, you know, mm-hmm. like I think the, I think the, the cat's kind of out of the bag and and the customer base is getting a little bit more educated where they're like, yeah, no, fuck this. I'd rather just buy like some bomb weed from the homie that grows it, you know? Yep. Yeah. I can speak that, that's that. What I'm I think, at. Yeah. Like, uh, and this was like probably three or four years ago, ODD thought I was talking to him about it because, you know, shit was fucking up in Oregon. And he's like, it'll come back around. He said, it's going to take two or three years, yeah. but it's going to come back around. And and it's come back around for those exact reasons you said is they would rather get the fresh bomb from the homie down the street or the, you know, the uncle or cousin or whatever, you know what I mean? rather than go to that dispensary model where they're, you know, getting an inferior product yeah. for a price. Def- well, because the problem what people don't understand is with these dispensaries, with all these things, these are run by businessmen. <clears throat> and so a businessman has to get a certain gram per watt and it's got to be a certain this, it's got to, t- you know, it's got to test a certain thing like THC. It's always a joke. Like when, when I deal with like these MSOs, they'll call like Neptune and I'll get on a consult with them. They'll be like, Oh, I, I need like something that's going to be a minimum of 30% THC. And I'm like, I sure, I, I guess, but like, you know, the cannabis plant offers a lot more than that, but they don't care because they're just looking for this. So again, yeah. it's like, you got guys like AJ who's like, yeah, well that's cool. But I, you know what I have, I got forbidden fruit and maybe it doesn't yield two and a half pounds of light. Maybe it yields, you know, a pound and a half or whatever, but it's absolutely phenomenal and shits on anything that these that these guys could get at the at the local dispensary because it's like and you probably get more for your dollar like i'll give you four grand bitch that's it <laughs> that's it it's like i was talking to my buddy the other day and he's like i would rather grow a room that produces half and get rid of it than grow a room that i can't get rid of it any of it yeah exactly dude like and again it's just like a lot of these mso's they're growing two-year-old shit you know because yeah. like, they come from different industries where they you know like Pepsi is always going to be popular because it's Pepsi. Well, it's like, well, you know, it's not soda, dude. It's like people don't want the same thing over and over and over again. They just, they don't want to smoke the same thing. Especially yeah. cannabis. Cannabis, cannabis smokers are real finicky. You know, they're real finicky. Yeah. I smoked this yesterday. I don't want to smoke it again. Yeah. You know? And also people's personal profiles. Go ahead, Q. I was just going to say, I, I feel like we're learning – and I could be wrong here, but I feel like we're learning and maybe AJ, you have a point of view on this one. Mm-hmm. I think that um, the end consumers aren't particularly brand loyal. They're price conscious. They're like, usually I have a certain amount of dollars in my pocket and I want the best weed that I can get for that. And I don't particularly care about brands. I'm more of a weed nerd. So I have, I definitely have brands that I really like. And if they have it, I want it. But at the same time, I'm also the same sort of the guy who I was like, if I have $80 or whatever it is, I'm going to try to get the most bang for my buck and try to optimize for price and quality and not necessarily look for particular brands and that's it. But I, I don't know. We, you, I know this is kind of jumping into later in the episode here, the questions, but you were on the dispensary side as well, AJ, is yeah. that right? What yeah, was yeah. That, yeah. What was that experience like? 
so the from like to say or i guess to to go off of what you were just saying like so owning that dispensary for a little over two years the the two things i can like that will always i guess uh really stick with me was i never had one customer who wasn't an industry person um that uh, asked about flavor or terpenes um never um when it came to flour that never happened one time um with me my business partner or any of the staff um the only time it ever happened was when that person then goes, oh, here's my industry card. Can I have 20 percent off like those very few? But like then again, I say and I mainly want to say that because like they're in the know. So like they're asking because they've been told to ask that um, a lot of the customers, though, wanted THC like that was what reigned supreme uh, in terms of the brand loyalty, like you were saying. There was no brand loyalty that we experienced when it came to the flower, but there was brand loyalty when it came to things like vapes and edibles. And that was mainly more, in my opinion, ter in terms of consistency. And I normally never shout out brands, but like one brand that just fucking kills it. And it's un it's undeniable at this point. It's like wild, like wild gummies. Their, their consistency is ridiculous. It's the same everywhere they are in every state. So like they have built a customer base around consistency and good on them because it's a super duper fucking consistent edible and their flavors are good. I mean, you can have opinions on flavors, but their flavors are like generic in terms of you can find some flavor that you, you're going to like in there. And then, well, you, yeah. You, you can imagine being that your focus of the market flavor wise, you know, you don't have a lot you have to diversify in. you know right. what I mean? So yep. consistency, once you develop consistency, you can bang it out where, Guys who are growing flour, like Mark says, where they're pheno hunting and they're yep. they're growing out this flour for a flour market. That's a that's kind of a completely different thing. And so now, when you were in this dispensary, go ahead, Mark. You were going to say something. Yeah, I was going to just kind of add on to that. The reason why a lot of the times that people aren't really brand loyal when it comes to flowers is because, again, a lot of this big money guys they'll buy a percentage of your of your brand, but then they'll also white label a bunch of shit into your bags you know what i'm saying where you lose a lot of the control over it the one thing whether you like them or hate them that the jungle boys always did is it's theirs we grow our own weed we sell our own weed and the jungle boys is consistently pretty good weed you know what i mean so you know if it's, if it's from jungle boys in a jungle boy bag it's going to be pretty good and they have a lot of brand loyalty there's always a line at their spots mm -hmm. they're always putting new spots but they did it right. They took no corporate money. They don't give a fuck, you know? But again, like like AJ was saying, it's it's of all the brands, there's one that he could shout out that says this is really good, you know? Because a lot of it's just like, a lot of it's the fuck fuck game, you know? And, and a lot of it's becoming, people are starting to realize that now. Yeah, It's like, you know, like, and I think a lot of rosin, a lot of good rosin and a lot of good like extract companies are really <clears throat> coming up right now because you can't really fake the funk on that. You know, right, yeah. it's not. And a lot of these guys and, are the biggest nerds. And know? I think it's something that works well in a rec setting. You know what I mean? Because most people in their homes are not pressing, you yeah. know what I mean, in a cold bot room, you know? <laughs> no, so, yeah. sure. You know, well, I mean, add, like, oh, go ahead, AJ. No, yeah, to add a little something to that, too, in terms of the flower um, on the rec side as well. Uh, if you like what Mark was saying, a lot of the dispensaries who are like very upfront, like this is my flower, like this is what we grow, this is under our KC, those places, like we had that. So I will say like there was some loyalty in terms of like right. us because people wanted our brand flower, sure. But like a hypothetical was there was um, one or two farms where I had like had friends who ran, managed them. And I told people, you know, like these facilities are very clean. They have a good product. They're doing it right even if you don't really like, like the smoke for like, you know, the smoke doesn't agree with you. It's still a high quality product kind of thing. So like you should um, really pay attention to these brands and try to shop these brands for these reasons. But then at the end of the day, a lot of customers, they hear all that and then they go, Oh, okay. Okay. That one says 37%. So I'll go with that one. And you're just <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know why he put that on the right. shelf, but okay. Yeah. So we, we, We've kind of talked about that a little bit about like in Oregon, you have an opportunity to shop, shop at dispos that are vertically integrated. Yes. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and that's kind of leading me on to the next question is how much were you guys relying on the wholesale market? And can you kind of speak to a little bit of the, the whole wholesale thing in Oregon and how that all shakes down? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, like uh, when I was, uh, I, let's say, like let's go back to the beginning of legalization. You could get rid of a lot of your stuff on the market pretty easily. Um, then we get to like a couple years down the road, it's getting a little harder. So you're utilizing wholesalers a bit more. It's not as much B2B. And then where we're at now is like very little is pretty much going direct to like, I would say just, I'm not saying myself, I'm saying generically in Oregon, most farms are not able to go direct to store anymore. So they are going to wholesalers. Um, and then the wholesalers are doing what they will with it, which either is going to a processor which um, let's put it this way. If I am a wholesaler who buys 100 pounds and um, I got a buddy that needs 100 pounds and uh, my um, metric or the, you know, whatever system it's in, if I would like to turn that into an extract, I can turn that in, I can turn that 100 pounds into an extract, get rid of all... Um, tag all history of that flower even being in the system and i can go ahead and say you know what my hundred hundred pounds of flour yielded out two grams of extract oil we fucked up and um then you know then i guess all parties get kind of what they're looking for if you i guess if you get to my drift with that um, hey, but we love it. We love your drip, man. Yeah, it's we it's just uh, the in the in our market, it's it's ridiculously, um, I guess, uh, manipulated just based off of what is being forced upon a lot of farms and a lot of people yeah. because mm -hmm. of the yeah. market and the way it's gone. Yeah, man. Like, uh, you know, it was well, it's the, the the funny the funny underbelly of legalization is the only way all these spots are staying legal. And I'm not saying you know any particular spot or whatever. I'm not naming mm -hmm. any names, but any way a lot of these places are staying legal, a lot of these farms are staying above board is the back door. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Like a like a lot like and that's like that's the saddest part is a lot of these guys want to play the legal game so bad that they have to do some like backdoor shit just to pay the bills. You yep. know what I mean? Yes. Just yep. to, like yeah. It's like I have two thousand pounds and people are offering me seven hundred dollars a pound, dude. Like what the fuck? And it's like damn bro that doesn't that doesn't you know that and then they get and the tax man comes and stuff it's just such a sad it's like a sad state of affairs like that how how this business devolves you know yeah. it's really shitty there's a big but, lawsuit and, right now uh with catalyst lewis at catalyst in california who's uh he's being sued yeah. by glasshouse farms because he's mm -hmm. basically he's alleging i should say all this uh he's alleged that glasshouse form i think the math basically breaks down to glasshouse allegedly is growing and selling more weed than you could possibly sell in the legal market in California. So therefore, yeah. if you're getting rid of all this weed at the end of the year, where is it going? And then he's yep. also making the point that when you go to New York or some of these other states where you see yeah. uh, like black market weed or whatever on the shelves, the brands that you see on those shelves are glass house farms, uh, seven leaves. There's a bunch of them, um, that you see on the store shelves. And so he's basically just saying, how does that weed get there? And so anyways, that's why there's that lawsuit. A question I wanted to ask you, AJ, that you made me think of real quick, um, is, um, essentially the question I had was what, what did your customer base look like at the dispensary? Like how many of them were kind of the weed nerd? versus the more casuals or newbies that are just because like what I overhear when I'm at the dispensary is usually what's the highest THC or like mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the highest THC indica or whatever it is and I was just kind of curious since we have you here in the show what was your experience with like the the typical customer that you work with yeah our typical customer well at that particular store so to give you i guess a, a where we were geographically we were northern portland and we were in a neighborhood that was very like basically on the back end of being gentrified um so a lot of people moving out a lot of people coming in um a lot of i guess very inexperienced cannabis users mixed with people who had been smoking their whole life um a lot of people so funny thing too we pretty much like obtained the um, full, we ran the dispensary for it's, it, it goes into like legal stuff that like, there's nothing wrong with that. I just don't want to explain it, but we ran the dispensary for a hot minute before we took on like 
full um like ownership on the like being fully registered and blah 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 and like having it be in our possession so we ran it for a, a while and then when we officially took over like when all of our name was on paper it was fucking march 2020 so if you guys remember what happened in march 2020 we had this little fucking thing go around that fucked up a lot of people and uh it required just an abundance of investment to make everything covid like safe and protocols and all of this stuff we never envisioned but on the back end we were one of the few businesses who you know got to stay open throughout the entire time so during that time um sorry to veer off a little bit but during that time we experienced something very unique because we had a bunch of people who sat at home and had nothing to do so we had people basically coming in going like i've never gotten high I actually said like to X, Y, and Z that I would never get high, but it's COVID. I have nothing to fucking do. So like, let's give it a shot kind of thing. Hell um, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it would be, it was super cool at that time for those reasons, but then it was super uncool because it was like multiple armed robberies of uh, just fuckery about so many different things, uh, vandalism, break-ins, just a bunch of shit that would really like make you um, you know, just question things because it's like, you're trying to do the best with what you got and doing the best <clears> for, <throat> you know, the new neighborhood that you are in. Um, but like at the same time, it was, it was hard. It was a, it was not an easy thing to do. Um, and it wasn't like we had, we were, uh, two individual people who ran it and owned it. So we didn't have corporate backing. We didn't have a lot of like stuff that a lot of the other stores did to kind of help with a lot of that, I guess, um, difficult, like a lot of the difficulties. So it was a lot of two, like just us thinking on our feet, trying to do what we thought was best, trying to implement what we thought was best. Um, and as you, as everyone knows now, I don't think it's a secret, like, you know, things were said that weren't true during that time. A lot of like things were put in place that maybe didn't need to be put in place. And a lot of like people had very, very strong feelings about certain things that now, you know, have come to light or were maybe were or were not as big of a deal or bigger than a deal than people thought. So just because of all of that, it just caused uh, or it just, you know, a lot happened. So we got to experience, I guess, a lot. But to go back to sorry, I went on a tangent there. Uh, back to the original question, though, was we kind of saw everyone, but the generic group that came through was more of the I get high on the weekends kind of crowd. Yeah. And, and how many, what would sorry. what percentage would you say were elderly, like older? Well, for our neighborhood, like where we were, a lot of the uh, elderly people had been kind of not pushed out, but they had left that area if there were very many. So it was, I would say, like probably twenty percent, maybe. And the the ones who were elderly too, um, well, I, I would say our dispensary wasn't very friendly to elderly people in sense of like really tall, really. Uh, I wouldn't say super steep, but like a very tall staircase. And we did have a driveway, but it was really steep. So if there was, if it was cold and there was, or a lot of rain that, you know, would detour people, especially if they were older, cause they would see that giant flight of stairs and then it was raining or something. It's Portland. So it's raining all the time. You know, that, that would detour certain individuals. So what you're saying is it was just a glorified trap house. <laughs> yeah, it really, I mean, it was a house and it was an old trap house. It was literally like, there were so many stories. That was one cool thing is people would come in and tell us like, oh, oh this used to be nice. this and that. And yeah, <laughs> that's actually kind of cool. Yeah, it was um, cool. I guess it was a, it was a family photo studio for like a very long time, which was interesting to find that out. Well, um, we're g wrap. We're gonna get into like the last uh, like set of questions, but before we do, I thought it would be good to have you talk about um, just some kind of lessons or things that you feel like you learned through the experience at the at the grow and then this dispensary. Um, we sure. can kind of wrap up this like kind of chapter, if you will, um, and just kind of talk about what do you feel like were some of the lessons learned that you would want to share with others that might be in your shoes from the past, you know, thinking about you know, going into the legal market or whatever and getting into these sorts of businesses? What what kind of things did you take away from that experience? Yeah, so, I mean, I've taken away a lot, learned a lot of hard lessons, um, learned a lot of good lessons, but um, I would definitely say 
Uh, make sure that when you're, if you're ever getting into business with anyone, no matter who it is, um, that you definitely have, you know, you pay the money to have an attorney of some kind look over documents if you're signing stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, like to kind of, I guess, shut that down, what Neptune said earlier reigns supreme in almost any situation in any business. It doesn't matter what business. Whoever's got the most money is going to win 99% of the time if there is a legal battle or argument or whatever. So if you're going to go into business with somebody that has significantly more money than you or you're going to be the lesser financial individual in that, you have to make sure that you're either being paid for your time, you're being paid well for the time that you're there, or you're agreeing to basically be paid out in some, in some type of very um, strategic way. If you're bringing in plants, you get paid for those plants when they get brought in or like at the end of the month or however, you know, a contract's worked. It doesn't have to be super an elaborate contract, but like um, even that too, if you get into a legal battle, whoever's got more money is going to win. Uh, so I guess just be smart about who you get involved with. And if you are partnering with a larger um, corporation, I would say it's probably in your best interest to probably um, not really go with a performance model, even though you all want to perform well, everyone wants to do well. It's too easy yeah. for people to use performance models against you. Um, I would definitely recommend, you know, either a monthly retainer, a salary, an out, like a very fair hourly wage, just something where you're guaranteed, you know, to get your money. And then, uh, if you are getting paid, however you're getting paid, I would definitely say, you know, weekly or bi-weekly. Too many people, too many times. I can tell you I haven't been paid. I haven't been paid for so much shit. Um, yeah, I mean, I've consulted even at like Thousand Lighters who had me there for a week. And then, you know, basically to this day are kind of like what Mark said earlier. It's like, yeah, well, sue us then. And you're just yeah. kind of like, that's that's cute. That's, that's awesome. Cool. Um, and then most of the people too that, um, I would say that you do get into business with here or in, in any state with legal cannabis, really vet them. Um, you know, you really want to know the person um, that you're getting into business with. Uh, you hopefully want to know that they have some type of agricultural-esque type of experience so they understand how plant and or agricultural work um, works on a larger scale. Um, and so you're not bombarded with... Um, having to, you know, explain every little detail about how a plant needs to grow, that it needs water, that it needs light, all that kind of basic stuff that you would think is very obvious. Um, yeah, I could go forever on things to watch out for, I guess. Yeah. Well, I kind of sound a bit like a martyr right now. Well, be before we wrap up, there's one kind of another thing I want to hit on is um, you get out-of-state money that comes into a community – they're paying the people a pretty low wage to do the work. They're getting all their stuff direct, so they're not even buying from in the community. And then all those profits, if they make them, all then leave your community. Yep. So would you say that's a very similar situation to the farm setup that you were in? Uh, yeah, I mean, the last one, sure. The, uh, I would say generic, well, that one in particular, uh, they had all these claims of all these different things that, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't even know half of what was said was even true. Um, but, uh, all of, I guess I can say this though, all of the money that I made for them, for the most part, um, was put back into the people and making the grow better. Um, but at the same time, uh, yeah, it's hard to do that when kind of what you guys spoke on, when you're not willing to take care of your people, it doesn't really matter how much you improve a facility if there's no loyalty and or um, respect to your workforce. Right. Yeah. I, I wanted to throw in another kind of lessons learned, uh, at least that I can share for, on my end, which I think is probably relevant in some of these deals, uh, which is uh, get paid in, in cash or you know, like actually get paid money versus getting paid in stock or equity. So, I like, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, a lot of times when you work for small companies like this, I've experienced it at working at tech companies, they try to compensate you with stuff more so in stock and less in cash. And they're basically saying, like, hey, we're in early business, we don't have a lot of money, but we'll have, but we have stock that we can uh, give you that usually vests over four years, which is a decent mm -hmm. amount of time, actually. And then that <laughs> stock never actually turns into money unless the company's actually sold. And 
you know, one of the companies that I worked for that that stock might actually turn into something. I worked for them 10 years ago and I'm still waiting for that freaking stock to turn into actual money. So I, yeah. and most of them never turns into money. So I just, I definitely want to warn people about when you work for these sorts of companies, they're probably going to want to try to compensate you mostly in equity or stock in the company. And I would just, I would say definitely still get equity if you can, but definitely make sure that you're getting paid and can pay your pills because it really sucks to like take the pain up front when you don't like when you're working for a bunch of rich people, basically. Well, yeah. and, and to uh, the one little thing to say as well for anyone that is going to do a performance based model, if that's going to, if you want to do that, um, you do you boo boo, like you kill it if you can, but Make sure that what you're agreeing to on a performance model, that you've seen how the equipment functions and that you've been around for at least a round. Because if you go into a grow and you look at their equipment first glance thinking, oh, I can kill it. The guy that's here sucks. I'm going to do way better. But you don't know how this equipment's operating. You don't know how old it is. You don't know if it's been cleaned. You don't know how the maintenance of the facility has been. So I would highly advise anyone who's going to try to do something like that as well or taking over for a grow in, in, at all. You know, just because you see certain things visually doesn't mean that they're operating as you see them the one, two, three, four, five days you're there. Like you got to be there for a little bit to really make sure you can kill it. Because I've, I've had some friends who have lost a lot on making that gamble that they're going to be able to kick ass and take names kind of thing. And then, oh, the fucking <clears throat> DU's eight years old. The mini splits have never, ever been cleaned. The fucking HVAC um, like is bleeding all like the, the pans bent. So it's fucking leaking all over the t like, you, you know, oh, like just shit. Oh, it's never they've never used a hypochlorous or any type of enzyme to clean out their lines. So their lines have biofilm that's fucking caked up, you know, centimeters thick. It just. Yeah, I could go on and on. Well, just sure. be smart. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Well, I appreciate the discussion. Yeah. Take it away, JR. Yeah, so like uh, now moving forward, uh, you know, what do you got on the table moving forward? Just consulting for right now, um, doing helping people where I can. So if anyone needs any consulting, can help with pretty much setting up as really whatever you need, just hit me up. Um, I really like doing the, uh, I guess now I'm trying to maybe get more into on the back end, the art side of things. Since I have more free time now, I'm doing more of my art stuff and seeing if I can get something going there because I, I love creating art so we'll see if that can get going but yeah just staying open uh, looking for opportunities seeing if um yeah just what's what's out there I recently did get a home though in um in the area so I am excited about that but uh I guess that does challenge me to I'm not really open I guess to other state opportunities would love to do you know consulting out of state if it's short time but not really looking to move out of state at this time but man, yeah, that's kind of it for me. Yo, let's just sell a bunch of season clones, bro. Fuck, yeah. fuck it. Let, let well, it I do go. have that. I got that Bahama market. butter. The Fino hunted Bahama butter will be available soon. I'm gonna release that. Well, let me let me get in on that. I want sure. some. Yeah, I, I, I want that forbidden fruit. Let's let's sell yeah, yeah. a thousand cuts of that, dude. Let's get sure. Like, let's get dirty. Black market reigns supreme, baby. Like, let's go. Fuck fuck the white market. Black market all day, dude. Well, yeah, that's not definitely. To see anyone's dreams, but you know, this ain't my well, first rodeo. <laughs> well, unfortunately, to so like, if you don't know this, the black market's more transparent than the legal market. Like that, there's no, that, that's not an argument. If anyone wants to argue that with me, I'll argue it tooth and nail until I die. The black market is 100 percent more transparent than the legal market. 100%. We like to call it the open market. <laughs> there we go. Traditional. Yeah, it, it, it really um, is, dude, because, you know, we the, the cannabis was built on handshake deals from guys that at the end of the day, there could be something dangerous happening if you don't, you know, hold your part of the bargain. That's just how it is. And so call it pirate, call it cowboy, call it whatever you want. But that's the name of the game, dude. And it's like guys got into this because they didn't want to live within a certain construct and live within certain rules. They wanted their own freedom. So that's why I got into it, because like, fuck you guys. I'm not working on shitty nine to five paying shitty taxes you know nope. so and then the fact is now is like we built this whole massive multi-billion dollar industry and now these these other dickheads are just coming in and trying to like steal large swaths of it and they are but mm -hmm. you know you see it you see it time and time again stay it in stay it out fail 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 in all the newer states that are coming on this is the funny part 
is it's almost like they're designing the black market to win. It's like heavy taxes, minimal licenses, yeah, cost, yeah, cost to, cost to get in very high. So all yeah. these these multi state operators are the only ones that can afford it. But it's just like mm -hmm. okay, or even even like THC caps. Good idea. You got you got. Yeah, and then the cool thing is, is they piss off all the local law enforcement. So they don't give a fuck about anything you do with cannabis because they're so mad that they can't throw you in jail for it anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah man. I, 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 I'm with AJ. I'll die on the, I'll die on the, on the hill where people were honest when it was a dishonest business. Now that it's an honest business, it's full of dishonest people. You know, oh, so yeah. just, I hate it, but whatever. Yeah, I mean, I one of the places it. I was just at, like. To put to speak on that, like I had to point out, you know, that's black mold on your ceiling, and they were like, "No, it's this and that." And I was like, "No, you can. That's black mold, and they're a, a high end brands." And you're just like, "What the fuck, like, is going on here?" Yeah, well, that's also because the the margins are razor thin. That's what other people always forget. The margins are the reason why the black market props up the white market is because in the white market. You know, you could sell a pound for two thousand dollars in the white market because of taxes and all this other shit. Mm -hmm. But they end up making you know a hundred to two hundred dollar profit. When the black market, you could sell a pound for nine hundred dollars, and that's a nine hundred dollar profit. You know yep. what I'm saying? So it's really funny, like you know, like, like how this whole thing works is like, or like you're saying, the traditional market is what we call it, right? The, you know, the traditional market instead of mm -hmm. black market, right? Yeah. But it's like as that how that's really still the 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 industry fueling the industry, yeah. you know, it's like, it's crazy. It's at like, I was uh, just going to say these big companies, they're playing a different game. You know, I was talking about, I referenced Glasshouse farms earlier. They, when you look at their financial statements, their, uh, their business is set up in such a way that they profit at selling pounds for $150 a pound. That's their whole business. So they're and their whole business is trying, they're basically trying to set up the biggest, uh, greenhouse in the world, I think, to grow weed. And so they want to supply the whole states and, you know, the whole U.S. with this greenhouse weed from Santa Barbara at $150 a pound. They're just playing a completely different game. And that's why they're yeah, slower they, and all these other things about them. But yeah, they can play that game, man, but they'll, they'll never win. That's a, that's, yeah. that's a game they're never going to win because, you know, uh, I mean, maybe look, maybe they'll win in 20, 30 years. I'll be dead before that, you know, for when, when they win, you know what I mean? But it, honestly, like the idea of, of, of people just wanting mass produced trash and just doesn't, I mean, like may, maybe I'm a dinosaur. I don't know. Maybe I just, I know too much. I don't know. But like the idea of somebody wanting to smoke the same thing over and over at an, at a, and, and this, the quality that you're going to get, you know, like who's going to be growing it, you know, how's it going to be grown? What care was it taking? Is it just a, Ugh, that just sounds like shit, dude. Like I'd rather. Well, I think I think you know. the cannabis community and the cannabis enthusiasts kind of helps bring people into that uh, wanting to Absolutely. have quality and yep. wanting to seek out the new and the and the interesting. And so I hope the culture of our people and the culture of our traditions and in our industry, you know, keep keep the education flowing. Because we've got, you know, like what, decades of misinformation that we have to now change. And then on top of that, uh, we have to start getting people introduced to just buying based on quality, not just on, you know, what the bang for the marketing buck might be at the, you know, at the time. Well, I think yeah. anytime you turn somebody into the black market, a new customer to the black market, they kind of stay forever. And they're like, oh, yeah, I get it now. I, I get it. You know, I got um, my guy. Yeah, because this is better than what that is, yeah. you know? And, and I'm and telling you, for a diversified revenue stream to set up a small grow and to service your local community and your family yeah. and your friends, uh, it's not a bad thing. And if you bang out good quality weed, you will, you'll have a client list that will keep you busy as long as the lights are on. And it's then true. let me let me speak on that real quick. So at our store to to bring that back tenfold, like what Jr. just said. So like we wouldn't go through maybe like ten pounds of top shelf. Like I don't know, um, probably ten pounds of top shelf. I would say like biweekly maybe, which isn't like a ton. And um, I mean that was you know to customers coming in and getting what they wanted to get. And so if you're only going through like 
10, maybe 20 pounds of top shelf a month, um, you can facilitate that pretty easily through yourself and one or two other farms, like, and have killer fucking products. So like, there is the ability to do it right. It's just too easy for people out here that don't know what they're doing to go spend like just a couple hundred bucks with wholesalers on a bunch of bullshit and sell, you know, indoor weed that's eight months old. And that's one thing I can say to you as a consumer, ask when the harvest date was simple yes. question. If they can't yeah. tell you when the harvest date is, don't fucking buy it. And if they make yeah. you, if they make it sound like you are the problem for asking when the harvest date was, that's a problem in itself. Because I can't yeah. tell you how many times I'll only ask that one question. Ooh. I just want like the freshest stuff. Tell me the harvest dates. And they act like I'm the problem for saying that. Like if I'm out of state and I want to gram or I want to see what like people are growing and I go in, um, I know that's just the miseducation, but like take it, you know, take it on the chin. Don't get mad at them. They're just trying to do their job at the end of the day. But like, figure that out, figure that out for yourself. Cause you'll get the better experience. The, you know, the fresher it is within reason, I guess yeah, you don't want anything cool. too fresh if they're fucking yanking it off and sending it to the store. Right. Well, well, AJ, before we let you go, because we're we're out of time now, but I we don't oh. I do want to uh, let people know um, what kind of flavors you are working with, some strains that you're working with. What should people um, kind of expect with from you in the future? Because now they've heard you talking, uh, dropping all this knowledge. It's been a really interesting talk. What should they keep an eye out for you or from you in the future? Uh, yeah, I'm doing a lot of the shoreline work with that old shoreline cut. Uh, got that through Stony, so RIP to that, uh, RIP to him. Um, really, though, that's super nostalgic for me. So I'm doing a lot of work with that on the back end, and nothing will be released with that until I'm very happy with it. And it will not, it, there's going to be a, a, there has already been a lot of work done, and there's going to continue to be a lot of work done on it before I try to release, um, like a, I'm probably going to do like a BX two or something after that's all done. The BX ones are, are flowering now coming down, really happy with the smoke and everything. Um, the other stuff that I'll be doing more is the Caribbean vampire. I'm going to be taking that to F three and then BX two, um, kind of more trying to lock in that super artificial. The ones that I like the most are the artificial fruit punch that almost tastes like just like that, like, um, red gallon a minute made uh like i just oh i love it and they really lay on the tongue so kind of those two things um and then on the very last thing once i'm happy with my shoreline project i want to try to mix that with either cheeses or something old school to try to find that like rank you know skunkiness i'm not gonna say i'm gonna go for skunk because i don't want to get fucking beat to death in the comments but <laughs> i'm gonna try my best to to get something gnarly out of that um yeah well, JR, any last questions that you had? Because I know you we, you had some other kind of grow related questions, but anything on your mind? Uh, yeah, I was just kind of wondering as direction wise, a lot of people are going for the wash, a lot of people are going for fems. Um, are you kind of heading in that direction yourself? Um, no, not on the fems. I mean, I've done a fem project and it came out fine. Um, I didn't get a huge yield from it, so. I might or might not release some of them. Um, the the fem or the female I reversed was the old big dirty clone, which is there's skepticism about the lineage, but it's basically like white fire and tangy. So really dope genetics. It's a powerhouse commercially, fucking huge, just monster fucking colas. Always test real high too. Great smoke. So I reversed that on a bunch of my shit. Um, like I said, all of them have came out great. Uh, just fems aren't really my thing. Um, but I will do one or two fem projects in the future with like my Bahama butter that's selected because that was just selected out of a huge pool and it's a rock star. So I want to, um, I want to do something with that might do something with, uh, the shoreline back cross or I don't know, just, I, I would only do it now if it's a plant that's very, very special that I've created and I want to, share that i guess with the home growers who are very limited or i guess i should say the home growers who feel very limited um because some of y'all saying that i can't pop certain things you can pop whatever you want it's just whether or not you uh i guess want to feel like there's a risk um for someone coming in and saying there are four you know four seedlings there you only can have two like or whatever um i'd like to think that that's not going to happen to any of y'all but you know be safe out there 
That's awesome. Yeah, I've um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I've been growing AJ stuff now for a little over a year, and I really enjoyed uh, the voodoo fruit, which we called out at the top of the show. Um, really just beautiful looking plant um, and smells really nice. Um, are there any, uh, I guess one last question I would have about your stuff aj um are there certain qualities in plants that you think that people should expect when they get a plant stable plant are there like kind of qualities that you want to have in like all of your gear does that make sense like when i think of the plant stable what is what am i thinking of yeah so my whole thing is terps um and nostalgic nostalgic terpenes to me in terms of like flavors and profiles that if it doesn't smoke good, I'm not going to breed with it. Um, if it's, you know, tried and true, um, like let's say hype cut, if I will, I'll run it. And if it, you know, if in my opinion, it, you know, breeds or not breeds, if it grows true to what people have said, then I will try to breed with it. Um, but I'm all about the flavors. And then in turn, I'm a very um, visual person. So like everything to me has to be somewhat visually appealing. Um, I don't really tend to pick things that don't have good visual appeal because if it doesn't have the other check marks, but it has visual appeal, then I'm getting rid of it. So if it has all of the check marks and looks like shit, but then I got something that has all of the check marks and looks good, I'm going to pick the one that looks good and has all of the check marks as opposed to the uglier one. Um, but then again, you know, if there's something super special on the smoke side and it's not very pretty, I'm still going to use it. So it goes hand in hand, but I would say that most of my gear you're going to get, is probably going to be pretty. It's going to be pretty. Um, and I've selected all of my moms for, you know, trying to get that full picture. Cause I understand if you're a home grower or if you're a commercial cultivator at the end of the day, you want, pretty flower that tastes really nice and that yields a lot. Like that's what everyone wants. Um, structure, we can argue about, you know, wanting stuff higher, you know, taller, shorter, blah, blah, blah. But like at the end of the day, we want those three attributes. So if I select mainly for those three attributes, in my personal opinion, I'm, I'm doing my best to do, you know, I guess good by everybody, but then it allows me to then take my selections personally to how I want to grow and how I want to grow them. And that's kind of how I view it. If you're growing my stuff, you need to select based off of, you know, your environments and how you're growing and the plants that fit best with your style. Cause a lot of what I've released are F ones for the most part. So a lot of genetic, you know, diversity, you can get a lot of stuff happening there. And a lot of the stuff that I'll find will be different from what you find. Um, so I will say that, you know, those uh, packs of the voodoo fruit, are still available at NetTudeSeedBank.com. Yep. And uh, this is the time of year that people are looking to throw stuff outdoors and in their backyard. So don't sleep on these packs, people. This could be a really good option for you. Yeah, really he's, uh, I was just going to shout out some strains. I, uh, if you enjoyed this episode and you've been digging what we've been talking about, definitely go to Neptune Sea Bank, search the plant stable up in the search um, bar. And I'm just going to read some of these strains here. We've got uh, Lickable Wallpaper, which is gumdrop mm-hmm. buttons times sour tropical Skittles F2, which is cool. Sour Hawaiian yep. Candy, which is Maui Wowie times sour tropical Skittles. That will do really well outdoors for anyone nice. looking. Tropical Dank. That's a really beautiful picture there. That's the Primal Dank times Sour Tropical Skittles. Yep, and that one kind of has like a strawberry yogurt type. Well, most phenos have like a strawberry yogurt type thing. Uh, Primal Dank, too, to give him a shout out from Big Worm. Haven't seen Big Worm around in the seed banks, but he's a homie. And I like one, the one that shows up like at the top of the search is uh, Count Kushlati. I like that name. Yeah. That's the Gelati Mints time, Car- Times Caribbean Vampire. Can you explain that one real quick? Um, yeah, that uh, the Gelati Mints is uh, from Tiki, and that is the um, his version of I forgot what the the cookie strain. I think it's Gary Payton G- Gelati and. Okay. Um, yeah, what, what he was it's his version. I liked his I've grown both. His version was bomb. Um, I really like that female. And so I bred that with the Caribbean vampire. All of that prodigy is uh definitely not the heaviest of yielders, but they're all really, really tight nugs. Um, the internodal spacing on some of them are really tight, some of them it is a little further than I would have hoped, but 
at the end of the day, you're getting, I would say, like probably the best bag appeal I've seen um, is from that lineage, just because it has that just ridiculous um, deep purple pinks really triked out. Uh, the flavor on it, in my opinion, is kind of more on that. Uh, I guess it would be like a deep cherry kind of gassier side, not so much like chopped cherry, but more along the like, um, I don't know, like, I guess just a mixed fruit, but with that gas um, kind of backing to it. Mm. Speaking of that, did you ever do any fino hunts with that cherry paloma cross that you did and maybe talk about that a little bit? I have a lot of seeds of that still, and I need to hunt them. Um, but no, I dropped probably 20 at that last spot. And what, oh, a good thing to bring up too, uh, really quickly, if you are at a rec spot or if you're at a bigger spot where you're, you know, doing big pops or you're doing a lot, you got a lot of shit, like a lot of different phenos and stuff, you got to make sure obviously everyone's on the exact same page with the labeling because that was oh, one yeah. thing that oh, happened God, yeah. a fucking shit ton was uh, sometimes like people just put abbreviations that don't make a great one that I can give you guys is like a, almost 50 of the Bahama butter. Thank God. I figured like there was nothing else with a BB, but like well, for whatever reason, the guys labeled it as BH. So for like two or not two months, but like for a while, I went around like not paying any attention to this like big ass uh, like, you know, table of BH because I didn't even know that that was a bunch of Bahama Butterfinos. Um, and so like just make sure everyone at the facility is on the exact same page with abbreviations and labeling or else stuff like that will happen. And on the Cherry Paloma CV ones, that's exactly what happened because I had a Fino of Caribbean Punch CP and the cherry paloma, they just put all of them CP. So then oh, no. it was just like I had to kill them because I was like, I can't get this mixed up with the, no. with the premium yeah. punches that have already That's been awesome. established. And yeah. Wow. But so you still got a bunch of beans of that. Tons. Though, huh? I got tons. Yeah. Yeah. Can definitely hunt that easy. Or I can send them too. That's something I could offer. If anyone wants to to test some, I can Yo, Loki, we can help facilitate I was, it. I was like like send me 10 dude because like i know that cherry plum was fire dude and i have a i happen to have a four by four open right now oh yeah nice <laughs> i'm sure like, fuck, dude because i know that cherry plum was bomb dude that cherry mm -hmm. plum was bomb so anything with that slaps but yeah now give it to normal people i have millions of seeds don't don't give it to me because then <laughs> you know give it to somebody in need you know i'm sure there's a million guys watch this shit that yeah please somebody grow it, it it's it's gonna be good i promise it's it's be <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we right. should mention that uh that uh, like I'm checking out all of these packs on Neptune and a lot of these at least have freebie packs with them as well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. really great Please. deal right now on neptunescenebag.com. Thank you so much AJ. Thank you so much Mark from Neptune Scene. Yeah, I really you appreciate that. you guys. Thanks AJ. These are been super informative episodes we had a uh, great reception to our recent episode with the umami seeds which is in also in the nugs deep series um and these are just great episode today we really appreciate your time a lot of knowledge shared with everyone please uh, if you enjoyed this episode support the plant stable look up his stuff grow some uh Grow some plant stable out in your backyard this year. That'd be awesome. Um, oh, yeah. And thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks to our supporters and our sponsors. You can see their links down below and, and all their info down in the description. Uh, subscribe to our show on Spotify or in your favorite podcast reader. And, of course, uh, the show here on YouTube. And as always, JR, Growers, growers love. love. Guys, appreciate it.